Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for joining us at Provident Hospital, part of the Cook County Health and Hospital System. My thanks go to Governor Pritzker, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, and their teams for being here today. I also want to acknowledge our elected officials and community leaders in the room with us. In addition to Governor Pritzker and Lieutenant Governor Stratton, we have Senator Maddie Hunter, Senator Robert Peters, Representative Camille Lilly, Representative Cam Buckner, Commissioner Bill Lowry, Commissioner Dennis Deer, who's chair of our Health and Hospitals Committee, had some health challenges today, so he could not be with him. He sends his regrets. Alderman Pat Dowell, who's Alderman of the Third Ward, in which the hospital is located. Marvin Lindsay, who's a Community Behavioral uh, Health Association um, leader. Tony Strong from Heartland Alliance. Kim Dubouclé from the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, and of course Israel Rocha, who's CEO of our health and hospital system. Equity has been at the center of my work as president of the Cook County Board of Commissioners, and right now as we start to turn the corner on the COVID-19 pandemic, working towards health equity in our communities is more important than ever. For nearly 200 years, health equity has been at the center of Cook County Health. We continue to provide care to all, regardless of insurance status, immigration status, or gender identity. The majority of patients at Cook County Health are black or Latinx, and for those who have insurance, Medicaid is the primary payer. It's significant that today's event is taking place in Provident Hospital, which has a long history of serving the south side of Chicago. Since 1891, Provident has trained and employed black physicians, nurses, and other medical staff when other institutions refused shamefully to do so. Cook County Health acquired Provident Hospital in 1991 at the insistence of John Stroger and since then has invested millions of dollars in upgrades and improvements. In 2019, we received approval from the Illinois Facilities and Services Review Board to transform Provident Hospital. Within the next few years, you will see an incredible transformation, and all the while, our patients will continue to receive high-quality care. These efforts reflect why I'm pleased to be here today to celebrate the enactment of House Bill 158, the landmark Health and Human Services Pillar Bill championed by the Illinois Black Caucus. And I want to thank them for their work not just in health care but in criminal justice and education and workforce. I'm grateful for all of their good work. We're especially proud of the provisions that require implicit bias training for health care providers and the inclusion of perinatal home visiting and the coverage of doulas in the Illinois Medicaid program, both of which have, have shown strong evidence in improving maternal and child health outcomes. We also applaud the additional protections provided to individuals who seek emergency medical assistance in response to an overdose. Unfortunately, we've seen a record number of overdoses in the past year. So this provision is a welcome message to, our, to share with our community, along with the linkages to treatment and support. I want to offer special thanks and appreciation to Senator Maddie Hunter and Representative Camille Lilly for their leadership in passing this bill, which will bring greater access and equity to our health care systems. We look forward to working with all of you on implementation of this legislation and improving access to care for Cook County residents and for the residents of the entire state. Now, I'd like to bring to the podium the governor of the state of Illinois, J.P. Pritzker. Thank you very much, President Preckwinkle. Thank you for your leadership and especially on providing health care for the people of Cook County. Thanks also to the Cook County Health team for your partnership, Israel Rocha, who's in the back here, uh, and others that we've worked with to roll out vaccines 
to our state's most populous county. Uh, and I'm very proud to stand together to reaffirm our commitment to delivering high quality, affordable health care to all of our residents, pandemic or not. I'm also grateful for the presence of Commissioner Bill Lowry and Alderman Pat Dowell, uh, who join us here at Provident, Ho Provident Hospital. Uh, and of course, my friend Kim Dubuclay. I, I have probably over the last year not been able to see her in person, so it's great to see her um, for the first time in quite some time. Because of the leadership of the Illinois uh, Legislative Black Caucus and their four transformative pillars, Illinois has the opportunity to lead the nation, making significant strides toward the end of systemic racism, uh, for police accountability, for criminal justice reform, and for an end to the disparities that we all have seen in health care and job opportunities and education uh, and workforce development that exist in too many of our institutions. I'm very proud to be joined also by so many exemplary leaders in our state who are righteously hell-bent on that mission. Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton, Leader Maddie Hunter, Representative Camille Lilly, Senate Black Caucus Chair Robert Peters, House Black Caucus Chair Cam Buckner, uh, Joint Black Caucus Chair Sonia Harper, uh, Marvin Lindsay, uh, Bill Cates, and uh, Dr. Adele Cobb, Dr. Audrey Tanksley, uh, all of whom have been uh, very important in helping us develop not only these pillars, but also uh, in advancing health care for people across this state. Among the many important changes brought about by the Illinois Health Care and Human Services Reform Act is that it recognizes that whole health is so much more than just physical health. It extends legal protections for people seeking help for an opioid overdose because persecuting addiction gets us absolutely nowhere. It advances a commitment to strengthening the behavioral health workforce so that our healthcare infrastructure can, be, can best meet the needs of all of our residents. And it launches a study on violence as a public health issue so that we can ensure our state dollars are best directed at ending crime and violence in our communities. And already, my administration has made great strides toward health equity, authorizing telehealth coverage to increase health care access to vulnerable populations, including mental health services, eliminating the Medicaid backlog, signing legislation to bring $250 million in additional federal health care funding to Illinois, turning the health care and hospitalization transformation bill into law and working with the General Assembly to make Illinois the very first state in the nation to offer health care access assistance to undocumented seniors. Health care is a human right. Here in Illinois, we won't stop until everyone can access all aspects of it. Thanks to the Black Caucus's health care pillar, now law, we are one step closer to that reality today. So now I'm proud to turn the podium over to one of Illinois' preeminent voices for justice, someone who leads with compassion and conviction, Lieutenant Governor Juliana Stratton. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And thank you, Governor Pritzker. As always, I am so proud to stand with you as you govern our state with courage and compassion as well. You have now signed into law all four of the reform pillars passed by the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, criminal justice reform, education and workforce development, economic access, equity and opportunity, and health care and human services. It is a remarkable example of collaboration and your commitment to lifting up every community in our state with equity guiding the way. The governor and President Preckwinkle have already acknowledged all of our other esteemed speakers and those joining us today. So in the interest of time, I'll just say to all of our special guests, it's good to see you and thank you for putting your heart and soul into the work that makes for a better Illinois. I do want to say that it is great to be here at Provident Hospital with President Preckwinkle. You know, my father 
was one of those black doctors who served here at Provident that the president spoke about. And he really taught me through example the importance of accessible, affordable health care for every community. So to the administration, the staff here at Provident, many of whom are in this room, I just want to thank you for all that you have done to help us move through this pandemic. I know that you have sacrificed a lot and we are so appreciative. You are our heroes. I especially want to commend the sponsors of the Health Care and Human Services Reform Act, Leader Maddie Hunter and Representative Camille Lilly. I know that your heart for this work and your love for our communities is woven all throughout this act. Some of you may know that there are some tribes in Africa who don't greet each other with a simple hello. Instead, they traditionally greet each other with a question. And how are the children? See, they know that if the children are well, then the entire village is well. And if in response to the question, and how are the children, they are told all the children are well, then it was literally all they needed to know about the health, safety, and well-being of the entire community. Unfortunately, due to systemic racism, too many of our black, brown, and indigenous children are not well. In fact, the American Academy of Pediatrics says that the impact of racism has been linked to birth disparities and mental health problems in both children and adolescents. And when Illinois' children are not well, that is to the detriment of our entire state. So while there are many important components of the act, I particularly want to lift up the provision requiring child trauma training for daycares. Research says that 85% of brain development happens in the first three years of life. And during this time, billions of cells are growing and will affect how a child learns, reacts, and bonds with other human beings. Data shows that when children experience abuse or neglect, when they are hungry or housing insecure, when their parents are incarcerated, and yes, when they and their families must endure structural racism within the education, food, housing, and health care systems, they are in a constant state of trauma. And that constant state of trauma turns to toxic stress that can affect a child's life forever, especially when trauma-informed mental health resources are nowhere to be found. The health care and human resources uh, excuse me, Human Services Reform Act recognizes that trauma that is experienced by our youngest children is too often ignored and too often goes untreated. As such, it requires that all licensed daycares are to train providers on infant and early childhood mental health, trauma, and adverse childhood experiences so that trauma can be identified and families can be connected to resources. Nothing could be more important than ensuring that our babies can heal from traumatic experiences that are no fault of their own. Thanks to this act, some of our most vulnerable children will be on the path to healing and being their best selves. Thank you again, Governor Pritzker, for signing House Bill 158 into law, and thank you to the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus for your leadership. I look forward to working alongside of you on implementation efforts. It's now my honor to introduce one of the architects of the Health Care and Human Services Reform Act, someone who I am proud to say is my state senator, Leader, leader Maddie Hunter. Good morning. Thank you so much, Lieutenant Governor. And thank you, Governor Pritzker, President Preckwinkle, for hosting us here today, Alderman Dow, elected officials, the advocates, and all of our friends that helped put this piece together. Today, we are gathered, gathered once more to emphasize the importance of health care and human services. This pillar, sponsored by the Legislative Black Caucus to eradicate racism in the state of Illinois, this bill has so many good measures in it that I believe once enacted will alter the structures that have marginalized many communities for centuries. Measures such as increasing access to health, decreasing maternal and infant mortality, improving hospital reform, ad uh, um, addressing mental health and substance abuse needs, and several others that will lead to better health outcomes in our state. 
which is desperately needed. The COVID-19 pandemic has exacerbated the need for this legislation, and there is another crisis that needs remedies as well. The last few weeks, we've seen a surge of gun violence nationwide and around this city. Some were stunned to see all the violence in the news and quick to say things like, this is not America. Well, the truth is, this is America. We were a nation bred in violence, and every day we see the ramifications of our, of our systemic failures. While the violence we've seen in the last few weeks and even the last few months may seem irregular, it's been time for us to collectively acknowledge how frequent mass shootings and police brutality are. We must acknowledge that many have become so used to gun violence in this nation that they seem desensitized to it. I want to make this very clear. Violence is a public health crisis. We need to increase the dialogue around how violence impacts our health and the trauma that affects people every day. In this city, we've seen so many lives too soon, whether lives lost too soon, whether it be to gang shootings, mass shootings, or shootings at the hands of police on unarmed citizens. It is unnatural to consume so much violence and death and continue to function normally. According to SAMHSA, research has proven that traumatic experiences are associated with both behavioral health and chronic physical health conditions, especially those traumatic events that occur during childhood. Unhealed trauma can lead to substance use and mental health conditions like depression, anxiety, or PTSD. Trauma-informed care must be taken into consideration as we celebrate the passage of this health reform bill. Mental health is an integral part of our overall wellness as it is linked to our physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being. I believe that mental health and substance abuse should not be stigmatized. Instead, we should provide resources for those who may suffer from depression or opioid addiction, just as we may provide resources for those who suffer from other chronic physical diseases. That's why this legislation protects persons who receive conditional and revocable release from being deemed as violating their conditions or of release if they, in good faith, seek, seek to obtain emergency assistance for someone experiencing a drug overdose. This legislation also creates the Behavioral Health Workforce Education of Illinois Act. The purpose of this act is to leverage workforce and behavioral health resources to initiate workforce reform in Illinois. Additionally, the Underlining Causes of Crime and Violence Study Act, which will create, to, which, which, which created the, the Department of Public Health and the Department of Human Services to study to create the process to identify high violence communities such as R, R3, restore, reinvest, and renew areas, and prioritize state dollars to go to these communities to fund programs. I am also excited that this bill establishes a ch child trauma training requiring all licensed daycare home providers, licensed group daycare home providers, and licensed daycare center directors and classroom staff to participate in at least one training that includes early childhood social emotional learning, infant and early childhood mental health, and early childhood trauma, or adverse childhood experiences by July of 2022. These acts are revolutionary and bring awareness to issues that have long been ignored or undervalued. I thank the governor for signing this act into law, and now I urge him to help us see this thing through. We must ensure that these actions are fully implemented. 
so that the livelihoods of all Illinoisans, no matter what race, gender, sexuality, ability, or economic status are fully sponsored. At this time, I would like to introduce the House sponsor of this important measure, my colleague and my friend, State Representative Camille Lilly. Thank you. Good morning. And thank you, Leader Hunter. It has been an honor to co-chair the Health and Human Service Pillar for the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus. Uh, you are awesome. Good morning to everyone, and thank you for joining us on today. If you don't have your health, you don't have much else. Amen. I like to start my first page by thanking Governor Pritzker for signing this historical piece of legislation into law. Thank you for caring for all Illinoisans. You are making the difference. And as you always say, health care is a human right. And yes, it is. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, for always standing close by with vision and the energy and the synergy to make it happen. And President Preckwinkle, thank you. Cook County Hospital Health Bureau is the one entity in this entire state that understands the populations who need health care and provide that service without question. You do not turn anyone away who needs health care. And I thank you for that. Yes, please give them a round of applause. The fourth and final pillar of the Illinois Black Caucus policy is the plan to ensure access to health care and human services. I want to continue to thank the entire Legislative Black Caucus and Senator Lightford for our tenacity to get this done. With 34 strong, we stayed the course. We passed the bill, and our governor signed it. I want to thank all my colleagues in the General Assembly. 71 members of the Illinois General Assembly voted for HB 158. I thank you. We could not have done it without you. And of course, this starts with the leadership of Speaker Madigan, Speaker Welch, and my senator, President Harmon, who put together an awesome team to work alongside Senator Hunter and I to make sure that we had everything in the bill accordingly. And we thank Danny, Allie, Ruth, Patricia. Thank you. HB 158 is an omnibus bill. It has over 80 pieces of legislation that has been measures within our Illinois for decades. This bill is designed to continuously address the health inequities and experiences in the poor, black, and brown communities here in the state of Illinois. We needed to take action to implement key reforms to address health and human services systems or lack of systems that have been existing and causing racial disparity. Lack of education, lack of food, lack of housing, lack of job, lack of transportation, lack of health care. As stated and repeatedly reported, black and brown Illinoisans have faced these disparities for decades. And it has come, and it has become undeniably apparent during this midst of a global pandemic, COVID-19. Life expectancy should not be determined by your zip code. HB 118, excuse me, HB 158 provides the necessary initiatives to address these concerns. Today we're highlighting only four of the eight components. The Underlining Cause of Crime and Violence Act, Study Act, the Behavioral Health Workforce Education Center Act, 
the Child Care Act, and the parolee and overdose limit immunity. Each of these areas addresses the need to address trauma that exists in our society. As mentioned, violence is a disease. Violence is the third pandemic that we are dealing with and facing it in our country, and we must begin to address it. Nearly one-third of the gun violence in our state is related to homicide. We know that this plagues poor communities in urban settings, predominantly black and brown community, and instead of recognizing this as a public health crisis, our state have treated this as a criminal justice issue. We have failed to hear the needs of the hardest hit communities due to COVID-19. HB 158 is changing our view and how we're dealing with violence. As mentioned, we are going to address it through our study, the Violence Study Act, and we're gonna work with our Department of Health and Family Services and Health and Human Services in the state to study how R3, Restore, React, and Renew, can meet the priorities for the citizens of Illinois. And we're going to do this alongside Lieutenant Governor Stratton. Thank you. Rebuilding the infrastructure is the smart decision by identifying where funding is and needed to be. We will no longer suffer the disparities by funding and build, rebuilding our infrastructure. Investment is the solution. And as we deal with Behavioral Health Workforce Education Center of Illinois, it addresses the crisis level shortage in behavioral health professionals. This shortage affects every Illinoisan, young, old, teen, adult, who are in need of behavioral health services. Mental Health American, Mental health American ranks Illinois 29th in the country in mental health workforce availability. Kaiser Family Foundation estimated that only 23% of healthcare needs will be met at the current work workforce level. We need to address these in the issues in the rural and urban communities. They need our help, and this act does just that. Child Care Act, it addresses the need for child care and reestablish the highest standard of child care facilities to keep it safe for our children by placing emphasis on training and training in the area of social, emotional learning and early childhood and infant and early childhood mental health and early childhood trauma. This is the way we are able to meet each and every one of our children's need as we identify them early. The parole and overdose limit, um, limited um, immunity as Governor Pritzker mentioned, this is the time where we must be compassionate about the issues that many of our friends and families are dealing with, which is drugs. It, is, it has plagued our society immensely. And when people are seeking care, they should not be afraid to go seek care thinking they're going to be arrested. They need to seek care because they need it and they want it. We are looking in a different lens because this is also a public health crisis. Drugs has taken the vision and the commitment to our Illinois, our country, our world away. We know that this legislation is not a complete fix to the problems for systematic racism, um, medical racism in our state. HB 158 is a, is a significant step towards improving the quality of life for millions of Illinoisans statewide. This plan is to ensure all Illinoisans and residents can have access to health care and they can be treated to, for their health needs, something that all people deserve. The fourth pillar addresses the essentials of life. And I would like to acknowledge our leader, Sonia Harper,
for her leadership to bring these pillars into implementation. I thank you for your courage, your support, and your con continued commitment. You are awesome. Along with Chairman Buckner and Chairman Peters, our Illinois Legislative Black Caucus team is going to work alongside our governor to implement these necessities this year. Again, Governor Pritzker, Pritzker, thank you and your administration for all the hard work that went into creating this monumental reforms. At this time, I'd like to bring Chairman Senator Peters to say a few words on the work that we have collectively done for the people of Illinois. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Senator Robert Peters of the 13th District. Uh, I want to thank Governor Pritzker, uh, Lieutenant Governor Stratton, uh, Leader Hunter, Representative Lilly, the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, and all the advocates for this historic achievement. We are in the midst of three crises, a public health crisis, an economic crisis, and a crisis of systemic racism. But these crises aren't telling us anything new. They're showing pain and struggle that's existed for 30 to 40 years. What this pillar means is the beginning of us getting out of this pain, this trauma, and these crises. It simply isn't about public health, but about the intersections when it comes to race and class and when it comes to health care. It's about making sure that when we think about what it means to have safe communities in Illinois, that you have the health care that you need, the dignity that you need. It's important to understand that for some of us as children, we've been marked as being disposable, thrown away to the side. Our trauma, our pain, our parents' trauma, their pain, the, our grandparents' trauma and their pain often tossed aside and thrown into trash. This is the beginning of saying that young people in this state are not disposable that they deserve the investment and the care that everyone, that those who have a lot more get. We have a beautiful state. It is an amazing state. We have beautiful people. And it is important that we invest in everyone, no matter their zip code. This pillar, when it comes to black maternal health, when it comes to violence prevention, when it comes to the workplace, particularly in childhood development, invests in people all throughout the state. I'm sick and tired of the same old talking points about people going through pain and hurt. It is time for us not to speak out against something, but to act. And this is that beginning step towards that action. I also want to note that during this pandemic, during this pain, the role of black workers in healthcare, oftentimes we threw them a clap as if that was enough. This is about investing the fact that when we think about our health care and we think about care, it is often black women who are looking out for us in that time of need. And it is, it is important that we understand that yard signs, window signs, and clapping is not enough. This is the action. This is the beginning of moving out of these, pan these three crises. This is us looking at 2021 as a time when we look towards each other and we say we are here to help. So I want to thank the Legislative Black Caucus and everybody who made this happen. And I want to say that as we come out of this, there needs to be more, not just the implementation of this, but to continue to be bold in the face of pain and trauma. Thank you. I would like to introduce uh, Representative Cam Buckner. Thank you. Good morning. To Governor Prisker, uh, Lieutenant Governor Schreiden, President Prickwinkle, uh, my alderman, Pat Dow, uh, Commissioners Kim Dubake and Bill Lowry, and my brothers and sisters of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus, to the advocates, the allies, the supporters, and the partners here today, um, welcome to the 26th House Legislative District. 
uh, and to um, Providence Hospital. It's exciting to be here today to celebrate the signing of the Black Caucus health care pillar at this pivotal time because we've all seen around us how much this is needed. I want to be very clear. COVID did not get us here, but it did highlight the issues that already existed. It highlighted inequitable access to care and that implicit bias plays a major role in disparate outcomes in communities of color. It highlighted that black and Latino patients are significantly more, significantly more underinsured. It highlighted something that Representative Mary Flowers and Representative Camille Lilly and Senator Maddie Hunter have told us for a very long time that black women are more than three times more likely to have maternal uh, death and that infant mortality uh, for black children is 2.3 times higher than for their counterparts. But through collaboration and determination and the complete buy-in of Governor Pritzker, thank you, um, we now stand here at the dawn of a new day in healthcare delivery in this state. HB 158, which is now law, creates new oversight mechanisms that require state funding be, that is sent to medical providers to be focused on holistic care, coordination, and case management to improve the lives of patients and not to pad profits for wealthy executives and investors. It creates steps to ensure that the state expedites payments for hospitals that care for the most vulnerable people in the most underserved communities. It also provides for expanded access to mental health treatment, lower costs for blood sugar testing materials, coverage of doula services to provide more individualized care for mothers and babies, and anti-bias training for doctors and nurses. We're here today at the first black owned and operated hospital in the entire country where a black man, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, performed the first ever successful open heart surgery. This building, this hospital, is a monument to what's possible, and so is this legislation. Simply put, this is a win. And I want to once more thank everyone who worked so hard to get us to this moment. Now the real work begins. Thank you, and I would like to bring up Mr. No, sorry, Commissioner Bill Lowry. Let me first say thank you uh, to my dear friend, Rep Buckner. We appreciate all of your good work. Uh, we appreciate your leadership and your service is rooted in all of the right reasons. Welcome to all of you to the third district and welcome to one of our historic jewels, Provident Hospital. Given the needs of our community, every piece of legislation created by our legislators must be generational. Today is important, yes, but tomorrow, tomorrow is important to this city, tomorrow is important to Cook County, and tomorrow is important to the state of Illinois. The Illinois Legislative Black Caucus's four pillars legislation is a generational piece of legislation. Whether you're talking economic equity, education, criminal justice reform, or health care, this legislation is needed. And I am so very excited that you, Governor Pritzker, you've signed it. And I am so grateful for the leadership of my dear friend, Senator Hunter and Rep. Lilly for making this day possible. So again, all of you, welcome to the third district. Welcome to the historic Provident. And it is now my pleasure to introduce another dear friend, the Alderman of the third ward, Pat Dowell. Thank you, Commissioner Lowry. My name is Pat Dowell, I'm the third ward alderman, and it is so fitting that this important announcement for HB 158 is made here at Provident Hospital, a historic institution in the third ward of the city of Chicago, where many residents of the Bronzeville community and elsewhere in Chicago struggle with the medical challenges of diseases like diabetes, 
high blood pressure, COVID, and other chronic diseases. They struggle with this because of the disparities that we have in our society caused by structural racism. I want to thank Governor Pritzker for signing this historic legis legislation. I want to thank my state senator, Leader Maddie Hunter, who has been a consistent champion of human services over the, as many years as I've known her. This has been a consistent, genuine commitment of hers. I want to thank Representative Camille Lilly for being her partner in crime. I want to thank the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus for staying the course and charting a new path forward for us in the future. I want to thank the advocates for constantly pushing the agenda forward. I also want to thank President Tony Preckwinkle and Commissioner Bill Lowry and Dennis Deer for their continued investment in Provident Hospital. Provident Hospital is a beacon on the south side and their investment to transform and expand the services here is something that our community greatly needs. So I'm just delighted to be a part of this announcement today. I think that this is, uh, bodes well for all of the people in the state of Illinois, that this pillar is upheld and uh, put forward before us today. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation, and I'd like to ask Marvin Lindsay to come forward and say a few words. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Marvin Lindsay and I am the CEO of the Community Behavioral Health Care Association. Our state's behavioral health community has been sounding the alarm on our behavior, state's behavioral health workforce shortage crisis. A crisis that has weighed acutely on both rural regions and communities of color, like this one here in Grand Boulevard. COVID-19 pandemic has worsened this crisis. Today in Illinois, 38% or nearly 4.9 million individuals reside in behavioral health workforce shortage areas. Our state has long lacked a behavioral health workforce strategy, but Illinois' new health equity law takes a crucial step at addressing this strategic problem. Enshrined in the new law is a crucial provision that creates an independent university-based center, the, Illi the Behavioral Health Workforce Education Center of Illinois, which will be dedicated to improving access to behavioral health care across Illinois by developing and implementing a strategic plan for the recruitment, retention, and education of a qualified diverse and involving behavior health workforce. An Illinois Workforce Center, will re which will require a $6 million investment in this year's state budget to get off the ground, will go a long way to rebuilding our workforce. Finally, I must express my deepest appreciation to Governor Prisker for supporting the legislation and to the law's sponsor, State Representative Camille Lilly and State, State Senator, my friend, Maddie Hunter, who welcomed and embraced the vision of a Behavioral Health Workforce Center for Illinois. Thank you, and now I would like to introduce Mr. Tony Strong from Heartland Alliance. Thank you, Marvin, and thank you to all the previous speakers. Equity and opportunity for all is what Heartland Alliance fights for. As a substance use specialist assisting participants with mental health issues, I've seen how difficult it can be for vulnerable people to receive access to health care. During COVID-19, those barriers often are the difference between success and failure, life and death. Ultimately, we want people living with mental health or substance use disorders to feel confident that the community has their back. Thanks to the commitment and focus of the Illinois Legislative Black Caucus and the Governor's Office, this new law takes steps toward building trust in a system for the most vulnerable in our communities. 
This means that Illinois now has the strongest Good Samaritan law in the country, showing that we value the lives of neighbors, friends, and family members struggling with opioid use. This empowers people to care about the well-being of others more than the judgment of the community, and it will save lives. In my work, we try to serve people exactly where they are, without judgment. This bill strives for that by creating a statewide community health worker program that will help reach people in culturally competent ways. Tearing down barriers to health care means tearing down the stigma faced by the most vulnerable in our communities. I applaud our policy team at Heartland Alliance and our leaders here today for tackling this head on. I would now like to turn it over to the governor for questions and answers. Thanks, Tony. Happy to take questions from members of the media. Marianne. Hi. Well, I've promised to veto an unfair map, and I've also, you know, as you know, I advocated for uh, a, an independent commission by a, an amendment to the Constitution. That was not something the legislature uh, chose to move forward with. Uh, so now, you know, what we need is we can't have any unconstitutional endeavor here. Uh, so the best that I can do and the thing that I'm looking for, and I've talked to the leaders and the members about this, is we need a fair map. We want both sides talking to one another, and we also need to make sure that that map is representative of the diversity of this state. Uh, there are many districts that are drawn because of the Supreme Court rulings that have been made over the last number of years, but, uh, but also districts that need to be drawn to represent the populations that even putting aside those uh, Supreme Court rulings need to be drawn. So I'm looking forward to the legislature doing its job, getting through the, I know they've gotten through their redistricting hearings uh, and we'll move forward. I have not seen any maps yet or any methodology. Good. I think they're trying to get us the most help that we can get, making sure that we have um, the best, most expert eyes that we can on our veterans' homes. As you know, I brought in a new director of the Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, he had run the Ohio Veterans Homes. He has a tremendous amount of experience, and, and I think the veterans community has a great deal of faith in him as well. I know I do. And so I look forward to, look, I think we should make sure that we're being as transparent as we possibly can. I've been doing that since the very beginning of the challenge at LaSalle a Veterans Home, and we'll continue to do that going forward. Yeah, Chris. Did, yeah, Chris. Well, let me start by saying that, as you know, we've set out metrics. Everybody can look at them. They can see what those metrics are. We've met the metrics for at least crossing the 50 percent uh, vaccinated uh, portion of our population, 70 percent uh, of our seniors, 65 and over. It's now almost 80 uh, percent. And, and then in addition to that, the hospital admissions need to be at least stable or going down, uh, hospital admissions for covid uh, 19, as well as uh, we need to make sure overall that our hospitals are available, uh, even with all the COVID admissions available to people who are sick for other reasons, right? A heart attack or they get into a car accident. So, um, so it's, I think we've been very transparent about what the, the measurements are. Uh, and so everybody can follow along. It looks to me like we're on a decent trajectory. 
Um, I can't say exactly what day that is. Um, certainly the Department of Public Health can give you the exact date. Uh, but it, it feels to me, it looks to me, if you look at all the hospital admissions data, like we're in decent shape and moving exactly as I would hope we would toward the bridge phase. Um, I, I believe that, I don't know the answer to that. I, honestly, I, I'm asking you to look at the IDPH data. Um, I believe that it may be next week. Um, and it's only because I haven't looked at today's data or the data from yesterday uh, with regard to hospital admissions. Um, so so uh, forgive me for not being able to give you an answer today. Uh, your other point was, well, yeah. Sure. I think the common view is that Illinois has weathered this storm well, um, that we've seen what's happened in, uh, in Michigan, and that hasn't happened in Illinois, thank God. And, uh, you know, this virus is sometimes unpredictable. We've seen new variants that, that arise. Um, the UK variant is the one, of course, that is most prevalent, uh, and it uh, takes hold fairly quickly. And you can see the numbers rise very quickly. That's why we've been very careful not to move to the bridge phase while we watch that variant uh, in Illinois. But it looks very good so far. Um, we look at all of those variants. I talked to the experts about this. I think everybody feels like we're in a decent uh, position. Again, following the metrics, we believe that we'll be able to move to the bridge phase. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. I, I've been I've been amazed all along, Chris, at the the you know people's willingness to follow the mitigations, right? To do the right thing. Obviously, there are people who don't, and you know we've asked them to follow the mitigations. Um, you know, nobody's forcing anybody to do it, but this is about doing what's best for your own family, for yourself, and for your community. And I think most people in Illinois have stepped up to the plate. I'm so so proud of our state. Uh, and I would say, you know, as I have watched over the weekend, we had some pretty good weather. Uh, people got outside. We now know that, you know, as people are getting more and more vaccinated, uh, that being outside without a mask when you're vaccinated, people are, you know, even people who are vaccinated have felt maybe a little uncomfortable so far taking their mask off. But I think that the CDC has now uh, told us that it's okay, uh, that we, as long as you're not in a, you know, big crowd, crowded together, uh, that taking off your mask if you're vaccinated, you know, and you're in good shape. And I want to encourage everybody out there who hasn't been vaccinated yet. This is one of the rewards, really, is that we all can enjoy the summer without a mask on if you've gotten vaccinated. Uh, and, uh, and you're also doing what's right for, again, for your family, your community. Well, I want to be clear that now that we have some significant assistance coming from Washington, D.C. to help renters, um, you know, we had that back in the early fall, uh, which was a, a big help and allowed renters to pay their landlords uh, when that money was available. Uh, now we have new assistance and even greater assistance for renters. So we think that this will be a, a big help to landlords. Look, I, I paid attention to both sides of this. I know this has been challenging for both renters and for uh, landlords. And now that we have this assistance, it allows us to start to look at, you know, what the next steps are to, to begin the processes of people, you know, get, people are getting back to work. They're getting assistance from the federal government for renters assistance. And I think this will allow us to move uh, forward expeditiously. So. Yeah. I am very much looking forward to the Illinois State Fair. Uh, we've obviously been doing all the planning that's necessary for it. Uh, you know, barring some highly unusual uh, event occurring that would prevent a large gathering. Um, you know, this is a very large outdoor space. If you've not been to the State Fair, um, you know, this is a, a, a very large 
fairgrounds. I think that you know the IDPH is working with the Department of Agriculture to make sure that people will be safe. So I think we're going to have a lot of fun this summer. Uh, it's in August. I hope everybody will come down to Springfield to enjoy it. And then we have a second state fair down in DuCoin, Illinois, and that also is a lot of fun. And again, an enormous amount of space out there. I think we'll uh, we'll have a big crowd and everybody will enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you.